Hello everybody, welcome to Baiju's 6th, 7th and 8th grade channel. I'm your teacher Aishwarya and I welcome you to this video where we are going to be discussing the chapter Living Organisms, Characteristics and Habitat. Now in this particular video, we are going to be summarizing the chapter in under 30 minutes. So I will be giving you a quick revision of this particular chapter and all the concepts that are being covered here. But if you want to learn this chapter in great detail, in the description of this video, you will find a link. You can click on that and it will take you to the complete chapter explanation for the same. So I hope that all of you are ready with your notebooks and your textbooks to summarize this chapter with me. So without wasting any more time, we will get started. Now whenever we talk about the concept of living, we say that living things are those which can move around like you see behind me. Living things are those which breathe or we say that living things are normally found eating and feeding on food. While things that don't do either of it are said to be non-living. So often the things around us can be differentiated into what is living or non-living or what I can say is biotic and abiotic. So we can say that biotic components include all things which are living. Yes, like plants, animals, microorganisms, all of that. While on the other hand, if you see things like air, water, sunlight, they are not living, right? We normally say that they are non-living. Similarly, if you see even, you know, let's say when we compare things like um, table, chair, pen, we always say that all these things are non-living. So what is my basis of saying that, let's say plants and animals are living while air, water, sunlight, pen, scale, water bottle, you know, car, they're all said to be non-living. Are there some characteristics that will help me distinguish between living and non-living? Yes, of course. So we see that there are some characteristics or I would say some features that will tell us that okay if all these features are there then this particular thing is living if not it is non-living. So let's have a look at some of these features. Now first and foremost the primary thing, primary thing that we see is that all living organisms grow. Now, whether you take a plant, we know that if in case of plants which bear seeds, we see that they all start out as a young organism, right? It all starts off as a baby and this baby will continue to grow and then become an adult. So, we see that growth is something that is consistent whether it is in plants or animals. And we see that that is a, you know, a feature that will differentiate a living organism from something which is non-living. While on the other hand, we also see that for growth to happen, if let's say me as a young one has to grow, I require certain nutrients, I need certain food items. So we see that living organisms feed on food, right? Food is extremely crucial because we see that from the food we get certain components called as nutrients which our body utilizes in order to grow. But for any given activity, we also require energy, right? Any activity that you and I do, whether it is inside our body or whether it is on the outside, we require energy. So we produce our own energy by the process of respiration, where we break down the energy giving food items like the carbohydrates, we break them down and we release energy. And then we use this energy to carry out various activities inside the body as well as outside. Now, apart from just doing all of this, one of the easiest ways or one of the most characteristic thing that we see is movement. If we see an animal move around, we know that, hey, that's an animal, right? And movement is something that we observe. But understand that movement is of two kinds because we know that movement can happen inside the body and it can happen outside. So here we see that movement can be internal as well as external. Now in the case of animals, we know that we are able to move around or go from one place to another. So movement here is external. But what about let's say some plants or some fungi or some very tiny things that really cannot move around? What about them in those cases? 
Well, you see, in the case of plants, we cannot say that just because they don't move, they are not living, right? But rather we see that there is transport or movement of substances happening within the plant body. So we see that things like water, nutrients, minerals, they are all being transported inside the plant body. Similarly, in our case also, we see that there is various transport happening internally as well. So movement is both external as well as internal. Now, mind you, one more thing that comes in the case of plants is that plants prepare their own food. Now, in our case, we might be dependent on other organisms for food, but plants prepare their own food. And for that, water is extremely essential. So, movement is also something that we see. Now, another very important thing is response to stimuli. Now, you see, as living organisms, we have so many processes happening in turn inside our body, but we are also able to understand what is happening on the outside. Now, right now, you are watching this video, and if I suddenly talk softly, you are able to realize that. Or if I become really loud, you are able to understand that. Now, that is not happening inside your body. It's happening outside. Yes? Now, what is this what I just did? This is increasing and decreasing sound or I would say something external, right? So here we see that you are responding to something else, right? It could be an external agent. In some cases, some change could happen within your body also. So stimulus, that is there, right? This word stimulus or stimuli is anything, right? It could be anything which could be outside the body, or inside the body, right? Which will bring about a response. And living organisms have the ability to respond to things. You take the example of a plant, right? You might think, Kare ma'am, how plant is responding? If I go scream near the plant, plant is not closing its ears, right? Absolutely not. Response is different though. But in the case of plants, I'm sure like touch me not, right? You would have all seen touch me not plant or chewy mui plant. So in the case of a touch me not plant, what do you see? When you go and touch it, it will close its leaf. Now what is that? It is responding to something. What is it responding to? It is responding to your touch, which means that touch right here is a stimulus, right? Which is bringing or creating a response. Now, in plants also, we see that certain responses are related to growth. A plant growing or maybe, you know, let's say some kind of movement that we see, they are all in response to certain stimulus. It could be light, it could be gravity, multiple stimulus exist. Which is why living organisms, take the example of a cockroach also. Cockroach in your house will be wandering around in the night. The minute you switch on the light, what will happen? Cockroach will go crazy. It will be running here and there, right? It wants to escape. So that is also a response to stimulus. So this is something that we exclusively see in the case of living organisms. But you take non-living organism. If you go and scream at one table, will it respond to you? No, but here again, if I go and let's say I respond to, or let's say there is a car and I turn on the lights, not like the car is going to get scared and run away, right? So we see that response to stimulus is something exclusive to living organisms. Consciousness, right? The fact that we are conscious about our surrounding is again exclusive to living organisms. Now, apart from that, we see that there is excretion, removal of unwanted substances from the body. If it is something toxic, harmful, we get rid of it. And most importantly, reproduction. We have the ability to produce young ones of our own kind, to reproduce so that we can continue our generation. For example, Plants which have flowers will give rise to fruits, right? Those fruits will have seeds inside them. I take that seed and I sow it in the ground. It will grow into a new plant, right? Similarly, you have dogs which give birth to puppies. Puppies will grow and become an adult dog and it will do the same. So for many, many generations, for many, many years, you will have the dog surviving or the plant surviving because it is reproducing. So all these characteristics that we observe makes something living and that helps you differentiate between something that is non-living. Now, of course, when we talk about the different living organisms, we find a variety of living organisms in our surroundings, right? And if you see what you see right behind me are some of the different places that I have visited. Now, this right here is the mountain regions 
This is about the extreme most that you see are the mountain regions in Manali. What you see right in the center are the beautiful, um, g you know, hills that you find in Chikmagalur. And what you see right behind me are some of the beautiful fishes that I observed in Chennai. Now, in all these cases, as I explored and I wandered through the different places, one thing that I observed was that the kind of plants that I found, the kind of animals that I saw, they were all different from each other. Right? And they had some few characteristics, some few changes rather. Which is why we see that the different animals that I found in different, different places, they were all in different habitats. So what is a habitat? You can say that a habitat is a place where an organism lives or it is the home of an organism. So you can simply say that habitat is a home of a living organism. Now, in order to survive in different, different habitats, we see that they have different characteristics or different adaptations. But more on that later, right? Now, broadly, if you see, there are animals which we find on land and we have animals which we find under the water, which is why broadly habitats can be categorized as terrestrial and aquatic. Now, terrestrial habitats are those which we find on land. But again on land, it is not like every part of the country or every part of the world, it is all the same. No, right? In India only if you see, we have places where there are deserts. We have places where there are high, tall mountains where it snows. We have places where there's a lot of greenery and forests. There are open, vast places where it is grassland. Which is why broadly we can say that terrestrial habitats are include deserts, forest and grassland, mountains and polar regions. While your aquatic habitats include marine habitat and freshwater habitat. Now they are all different from each other. Which means in order to survive in specific habitat, we see that animals and plants over a period of time have undergone certain changes or certain modifications in their body. So over a period of time, they have undergone certain changes or modifications where they develop some specific features that help them survive in that area. Because maybe it could be with respect to climatic conditions or whatever it may be, right? So in all those cases, they have developed features that help them survive better in a habitat and we call that as an adaptation. So let's understand the different adaptations that we find in different habitats, starting with the terrestrial habitat. So first up, we have the desert habitat. Now, deserts as we all know, right? When I ask you, what will I find in a desert? You'll tell me, ma'am, large areas where you will only see sand, right? So we see that they are large areas where I will only find sand. And then you'll tell me, ma'am, it is very hot, right? So in such cases, we find extreme conditions, right? So we have extreme climatic conditions or I would say extreme temperatures, where in the morning it is very hot and in the night it is very, very cold. And along with this, we also see that there is very less rainfall, very little water that is available. Which is why in order to survive in such areas, we see that animals like camels, snakes, rats are only able to survive. And even the plants that we find here are adapted or modified in order to survive in such places. So if we were to have a look at the camel, right? So camels are often known as the ship of the desert where we see that they have humps on their body that stores fat. They have closed nostrils that protect them from sandy winds. They have long eyelashes again to protect them from the sand and the strong winds that are there. They have these long legs that keeps their body right away. So we see that they keep their body high and again protects them from the sand which is very hot. And they have padded feet which makes it easy to walk walk on the sand. Which is why in such cases, apart from this, they sweat less, they have thick urine, all in all to conserve water loss. So all these modifications have helped the camel survive in the forest. Similarly, if you see in the case of snakes and desert rats, we see that they are normally said to be nocturnal, right? So we say that they are often nocturnal, that means that they are active only during the night. And during the day, what will they do? They will hide themselves in burrows or places which will protect them from the heat, come out at night in search of food. So again, this right here is a modification that we observe in their case as well. Now, similarly, if you look at the plants, the most common plant that we find here is a cactus, right? And if you look at the cactus, we see that they have thick stems which will help 
thick and waxy stem that reduces loss of water and we see that they are green. So the stems are the ones which pre prepare their own food. Then what about the leaves? The leaves that are there are the ones which are modified into spines to again reduce loss of water through transpiration. And they have deep roots that help them absorb water from distances. So there you go. You see that in a desert habitat, there are different adaptations that help them survive in the, such cases, right? Next up, let's have a look at the forest and grassland habitats. Now, if you look at a grassland, right especially in the case of grassland we see that there is a lot of greenery here large areas of forest that are spread across widely and a lot i mean large areas of grass which is spread across widely and we see that they receive more amount of rain when compared to the desert which is why they have diverse kind of plants that we find different kinds of animals as well and normally we see that in such grassland areas right we see that there is a predator we see that there is a predator as well as a prey. So a prey is an animal which normally gets hunted on. And a predator is the one that hunts other animals for food. Which is why normally we find deers, lions and all of that in grassland areas. Now we see that in order for a lion to capture its prey, it has sharp teeth that will help them, you know, tear the flesh. And sharp claws that can go and attack the prey. While prey on the other hand has eyes on either side so that they have a larger range of vision they have long ears so that they're very sensitive to hearing and we see that they have long legs that will help them run and escape now these are in the case of grasslands but in the case of forests if you see we see that there are many trees in forest right so you have tall trees and we see that again we have the concept of prey predators and preys even in the forest but adaptation in forests are quite different because in forests normally we see that their body let's say uh, the kind of skin that they have or the patterns on the skin will help them camouflage or hide between the plants or in such cases the predator has such striped pattern that will help them hide and hunt the prey and the prey also has the ability to camouflage and protect themselves. So in such cases, we see that frogs are one such animals which have the ability or the body color is a greenish in color so that they can camouflage and protect themselves. Similarly, we also see that there are caterpillars where normally caterpillars are hunted by various birds and other organisms and they also have a greenish color that help them camouflage. Next, of course, we have the mountain habitat. Now, the mountain habitat that is there is normally, again, we see that they are at a higher altitude from the sea. So, in such cases, we see that the temperatures here, especially during the rainy sea, I mean, during the winter season gets very extreme. Which is why animals that we find here are normally the mountain goat or we find the yak. And in both cases, they have thick fur, they have strong hooves, they have very thick, again, they have thick skin that protects them from the extreme conditions and also helps them climb and walk around in the rocky regions. While the plants that we find here are normally conical shaped trees, right? What we often call as Christmas trees. And we see that the leaves that they have are needle-like. So they have needle-like leaves so that the snow or the rain can slide off easily. And they are cone-shaped again so that the snow can fall off and it can again protect itself, right? So these are different adaptations that we find in mountain regions. Now moving on to polar regions. Now, polar regions is where we find extreme weather, right? Now, you have the North Pole and the South Pole. And regions in and around the Arctic or what we call as the Arctic regions have extreme temperatures, very, very extreme temperatures. Mostly, it is covered throughout with snow all throughout the year, which is why we see that in the Northern Pole, we normally find polar bears. In the Southern Pole, we normally find the penguins. Now, in the case of polar bears, we see that they have a thick layer of fat that keeps them warm. We see that they have whitish fur that helps them in camouflage and large feet which give them a grip on ice. And all these conditions or all these adaptations and features help them survive in these extreme conditions. Now let us move on to the aquatic habitats. Now in the case of aquatic habitat, we again have marine aquatic habitat and freshwater. Now, marine habitats are those which includes your sea and ocean, right? Now, in the case of sea and ocean, we see that the salt is very, very high or we say that they are extremely saline, which is why the animals that we find in marine habitats are also such, where they are adapted 
to such conditions. Now, normally animals that we find here are whales, octopus, fish and kelp. Now, in the case of fishes, if you see, we see that fishes have a streamlined body, which is broad in the center and narrow at the edges, which help them swim in the water through the ocean currents and cut through them with minimum resistance. They also have fins, tails that help them swim and move around. They also have gills that help them breathe underwater. Now, on the other hand, if you look at whales, again, they have a streamlined body, but we also see that they have blowholes which are located on the upper part that help them breathe. Now, we see that this allows them to breathe in the air when they are closer to the surface so that they can stay underwater for a longer period of time. Now, of course, we also see that in the case of um, dolphins as well, we observe this particular feature. Now we have kelps which are again found underwater and we see that they are um, they have the ability to survive strong waves and turbulent water as well. And last but not the least, oct octopuses are there which again, we see that they have these eight tentacles, they have no bones in them and of course they can camouflage and attack their prey. Now, of course, the last habitat that we're going to discuss is the freshwater habitat. Now, unlike your marine habitat, your freshwater habitat has very little salt present, right? Very little salt that is present in the water. And normally, your rivers, lakes, oceans, I mean, rivers, lakes, ponds are all said to have freshwater habitat or come under that category. Now, in the case of ponds or lakes, you would have seen that there are many plants which are found floating on the surface, like let's say lotus or you also have, you know, water lilies that are there and some which are found submerged. Now, the fishes as well, if you see, have the same characteristics, but their body is adapted to such a way that they can survive in such cases. Now, on the other hand, fishes which are found in high, uh, let's say in oceans and let's say in seas, they are adapted to that high salt content, which is why if you take a fish from a pond and put it in the sea, it will not survive. And the same goes for it vice versa also. Now, in the case of plants, if you see, we see that again, we see that the roots in the case of these plants, they are not very elaborate. They are pretty reduced in size, but we see that they have long hollow stems, right? So, we see that they have long hollow stems which allow the plant to either float on the, float, uh, on the surface or they are found underneath the ground as well. So, we see that water lilies have roots fixed long hollow stem and the flowers are found floating on the surface. Well, in the case of Balsneria, they are found underground and we see that they have ribbon shaped leaves and they have small roots that help them anchor themselves in the soil. So with this, if you see, we have discussed what are living organisms, what are their different characteristics and of course we have discussed the different adaptations and the features that we see in different habitats. So here's a quick homework question for all of you that I would like you all to try. List down some of the key adaptations that we see in a grassland habitat. So this is a homework that I would like all of you to do and make sure you write the answer. So thank you so much students for staying with me till the very end. I hope you enjoyed this particular video. If you did, do not forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button on the channel. Hoping to see you all very soon. Up until then, take care, lots of love and bye-bye.